It's always mountains, wildlife, flowers, and pretty things. I really like the photography that Montana has, or what people take. It's really usually gorgeous. There's a lot like painting the landscape and painting the natural world. The majestic scenes of the, the West, which Montana embodies. The artists that I've seen uh, often like to really show their like pride of Montana. Montana artists really depict the landscape in very different ways. Looking at different artists, you can really tell where, where they're from in Montana. I always think of the Native American art because I see a lot of that. It's a way to express yourself and people live here that need to express themselves through art. I know a big reason for people moving here is because they like the outdoors and they like the serenity and beauty of this place. And I think that can be construed as art also. So it's just, it's just different meanings for each person. Montana has produced an astounding number of artists and authors, from the native rock art inscriber to Charlie Russell, to A.B. Guthrie Jr. and James Welch. Montana's artists attest to the influence that the state's landscape plays in their inspiration and creations. The land inspires artists of all disciplines. The Montana Indian decorating a hide teepee, the country western singer in a Livingston bar, the landscape painter in Glacier National Park, the potter at Helena's Bray Foundation, the Billings mystery writer. Montana provokes art. It's hard to know why you fall in love with a place, but I think you can fall in love with a place as much as you can fall in love with a person. And I did. There's a kind of openness in Montana and an accessibility. In the West, it's pretty unique because we have such a strong tradition of literature and art. The landscape is dominant in Montana and it's unavoidable that an artist uh, will be affected. And then of course there's all these stories in the landscape that are, are very important to artists of all kinds, not only to literary artists, but to uh, graphic artists and to potters and sculptors and musicians, uh, because the landscape holds stories. And those stories begin with the Native Americans, they go through the early adventures and explorers, pioneers, miners, it's all written into the, into the landscape. The Archie Bray Foundation is a uh, nonprofit arts organization and we're dedicated to the enrichment of the ceramic arts. Originally there was a, a brick factory here and it was called the Western Clay Manufacturing Company. Uh, and the site dates back to the late 1870s and originally it was run by a gentleman named Nicholas Kessler who Kessler is a pretty prominent name here in Helena. We had uh, Kessler Brewery as well. He made bricks and made beer. He got rid of the brick business and kept the beer business. <laughs> he hired a gentleman from England named Charles Bray, who was a master brick maker and immigrated to the United States and ended up putting him in charge of this plant. And then Bray bought Kessler out eventually in the late 1800s. I mean, it was really good quality brick and, and the color was nice and uh, the durability of it was really good. Bray Brick went to many of the surrounding communities like Butte and Gray Falls and up in Missoula. 
Then, of course, he had two sons that were uh, very active working in the brickyard because there wasn't much of a choice then, I don't think. That was Archie and, and his brother Ray. Archie ended up studying ceramic engineering at Ohio State University. He had a degree in ceramic engineering and came back and ended up taking over the plant from his father. And um, he was a true patron of the arts. He was really interested in, in culture and trying to bring culture to a small western town. He's quite a passionate man, very interested in life, you know. And uh, he was a very hands-on manager in the brickyard. He was there all the time and insistent on very hard work. And as soon as the, the day, work day was over, he was really active visiting with his friends about art. He uh, started a community concert series that were that is alive and well here in Helena. It's in its 75th year now. And he also had a dream to start an art center. And that's how we came about. He really wanted to create a place where people who were really serious about what they were doing in the field could come together and work and share their ideas. He had a group of friends um, who uh, just encouraged him and said, you know, you got the perfect place to do something, you can do it right at your brick factory. They started with the pottery in 1951, and it's a real Jeffersonian model of democracy. There's a foundation of hard work and dreaming for their, for their future to be more involved with the arts. You know, that's part of the, the poetry of the whole place. This is a man that had dreams and uh, a place like this would have to start with a dream. Archie passed away 13 months after it got started. Archie's vision for this place was much beyond much more than the ceramic arts and I think we're actually quite fortunate it's really focused on ceramics today. The brickyard it closed down in 1960. Our primary program is a, a resident artist program where people come from around the world and spend anywhere from one month up to two years working at residency, very uh, independently directed, but it's like a, a open workshop for professional ceramic artists. It has to do with the sense of space here in the West that there is a great sense of generosity that comes through in the work. And I think in comparison with other places in the country that, that there is the valleys and the, the, it is truly the land of the big sky and uh, that sense of generosity is a great influence on the work. The Bray has this amazing reputation and long history and we've had amazing people come through here to work. Yeah, there's not really a look, I don't think, that comes out of here that may be associated with uh, other styles of ceramic work in the country. And I think that the reason for that is that we draw people from all over the country. What we're, what we're trying to do is bring people doing the best work in all different branches of ceramic arts and bring them here and see what happens when we put them together. I think the only thing the same about it is that it keeps changing. You know, that's, that's the great thing about it, is that it's really, it, it is constantly in a state of flux. Part of what is really wonderful for people when they come here to work is that, you know, quite often they're coming out of an academic setting where they're being, they're being questioned and they're, you know, being, uh, think people are looking over their shoulder all the time. And that's great, that's what school's about, but they come here and there's really a freedom to do whatever they want to do and I think that sense of freedom tends to make people work really hard while they're here. They really, uh, they want to do the best that they can do because they, they understand it's such a great opportunity. And it's a place to sort of unlearn the things that were sort of imposed upon you in the various institutions. It really is kind of a breath of fresh air in that way. Having the open studios where there is dialogue between uh, the residents, but it's a, total freedom to do whatever you want without any kind of judgment or boundaries and very healthy, I think. 
it's just part of the reality of being a working artist is that you have to be good at so many different things. And part of it is having at least some business sense about how to market your work, um, what kind of opportunities uh, you pursue. And I think that's also something that people get out of being here a great deal is that opportunity to visit with their peers about what those, those paths are. Part of what I cherish about this place is that it's an ongoing living example of individuals who've made that commitment to choose to live their lives this way, to explore the creative process with making. The state's fortunate to have places like this. It, it does give that example to future generations and to our world today because the opportunity for, for artists to have places to essentially retreat to are becoming more and more necessary and I think that we need these kind of protected nurturing environments for growth to happen and uh, thank God, thank God they're here. Yeah. He has the gift of being able to capture people's feelings through his art. And uh, when you look at one of his works, all of a sudden you're part of it. They speak with such honesty and such raw emotion that they really encourage us to bear our own souls. Ernie gave us a chance to talk. And he gave us a chance to say, all people are real. And, and, and they have this sense of self, and they have this vision of themselves. I would like to say that Ernie's paralysis has nothing to do with his art, but I cannot. Just as I cannot say, being Blackfeet is incidental. His paintings are autobiographical. Ernie Pepion grew up near Browning on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. He served his country in Vietnam, after a car crash broke his back and left him paralyzed, Pepion decided to try something he'd been doing for fun his entire life. I knew I needed to do something, you know. Now, art was the feel I choose, because that's the one I enjoyed. I think you got to go, if you're going to work at something, you got to enjoy it. Pepion enrolled at Montana State University and received his MFA in art. While at MSU, engineering students created a mechanical easel that allowed Pepion's creativity to blossom. You know, I can paint can large canvases. I don't have to wait for somebody to come and help me turn the painting around. So I do most of it upside down. You know, or sideways. So that way I bring the, the painting to me. The autobiographical nature of Pepion's art has captured the hearts of his audience. I paint so like, you know, it brings the viewer into the painting. I don't pull any punches. I guess I make, you know, no, no sorrow. You know, nothing. But people look at it. At first, they see, you know, like, you know, like, oh, sorrow. But then after they get done, it's like lifted. I can't say they feel joy. But I think his talent certainly lies um, in his storytelling abilities. He, he tells his story, he tells a Blackfeet story, he tells the story of a Vietnam vet. He, he tells all these stories and yet we end up feeling, I think, so personally affected by those stories. I used to use horses, a stick horse, that I made for my wheelchair so my wheelchair becomes a 
metaphor for a, for my horse. So I say to Balfour, do everything, you know. Never afraid to show his life in his paintings, Pepian's art reached new levels with his Red Man series. And they're kind of shocking at first. And, but uh, then they, uh, but then they're peaceful. I felt that that's, he wanted to shock everybody. He wanted to let everybody know how painful that it is to be paralyzed, uh, to be a quadriplegic. The world may not be largely accessible to Ernie Pepion, but in return, Ernie meets the world with complete accessibility and transparency, made possible in his art through humor and honesty and talent. Ernie's had an incredible impact um, in the art world, I think both statewide and nationally. He's, uh, he's a wonderful advocate for the arts and he's done tremendous work for kids. And I think a lot of times people get the feeling because Ernie is handicapped and he can't do a lot, um, that he needs us. And basically it's the opposite. We need him. Uh, we need him to continue to co inspire us uh, so that we can go on for the challenges that we face every day. When I was in middle school, people's heroes were like John Alway, Michael Jordan, Dominique Wilkins, you know, and they would, they would ask me, well, who's your hero? And I told these people, it's my Uncle Ernie. I know that when we visit with him and everything, he knows that he has a purpose there. And the purpose is not only for his art, but for his family. For all of us, because he, through him we live.